Act 1, Scene 5, Patricia Adonis Dunning. She's a Maine native from Auburn, yeah. Has exhibited nationally and currently holds the unofficial title of Queen of Portland's Arts District. Patty is a RISD graduate and has taught jewelry design at Boston University and Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. Patty's been honored to win many industry competitions, including De Beers Diamonds Today Award, two World Gold Council Grand Prizes, and a 2013 Manufacturing Jeweler Society Vision Award. Patty sees jewelry as site-specific sculpture, engaging engineering, art, and fashion. Her good friends say that they have witnessed that even while working several jobs, she's retained an amazing passion over many long years and countless craft shows, and understand that if she hadn't spent the hours learning the metal in a very intimate way, she would not be as strong a designer as she is. Good, but not as eloquent. Ladies and gentlemen, Patty Dunning. We got this commission to do this really cool egg, which was pretty amazing. Anyway, so it was the nest egg, and um, you know, I really hadn't thought too much about an egg, and so um, it was pre-Easter, and there were lots of eggs around, so I actually went online afterwards and started looking at eggs online. Um, the client thought that a nest might make a good stand for the egg, and I kind of discouraged that idea, but it would need something to hold it but we weren't sure quite what that was gonna be yet. I suggested they couldn't present him with an empty egg and that maybe it could have small sculptures inside that reflected moments of his life. They, could, um, they gave me a laundry list of things about him and again, I went online for research. He liked chocolate, he traveled a lot for business, loves Maine, Mount Katahdin, has a son, and eventually the column that would become our idea for a plinth. Using the 21st century technology of my jewelry designing program, I put together this presentation to show them how the final egg might look. It would be on a turned plinth, opening in the center, and inside would be the mementos of his life in sterling silver. They approved it. We took a sheet of 18 karat gold that was five and one eighth inches by 20 gauge, which is just under a millimeter in thickness, and cut it into a disc. We would be using the same technique Paul Revere used to create his teapots. It would be hammered into the egg form. It would take many hours. We had a month. In reality, it sh we should have had three months. This was a totally impossible project. Using the latest in 18th century technology, we started to hammer the egg. <laughs> if you can imagine a round circle of fabric with a thread around the circumference and you pull it, it becomes egg-shaped. Well, the hammering actually compresses the metal in the same way. You just don't get the wrinkles because it's so much slower. Every time it is hammered from the center to the edge, the metal has to be heated up with a, to a torch to be made soft again. This is called annealing. The hammering work hardens the metal the same way of bending a wire makes it stiff and breaks. The hammering and annealing process go on and on until the form is achieved 20, 50, 100 times. The metal is compressing. Dan, a MECA student who works with us, is shown hammering on a T-shaped anvil with a we special wedged hammer that moves the metal perpendicular to its face. Dan's specializing in hollow oil raising, and this was a really special opportunity to be able to work with such a large piece of gold. The metal is compressing more. The bottom of the form is getting smooth with a flat hammer that's planishing it. Ultimately, the entire egg will be planished. There is a brass model in this picture that shows where we are going. It allowed us to work things out and to make our mistakes. Photographer Christopher Ayers sent me photographs of Knife Edge at Mount Katahdin for one of our mementos. In two days, after some really weird forms, I carved Mount Katahdin using pink dental wax and casting it in sterling silver. Some of the other mementos would be done collaborating with a CAD specialist. In my proposal, the egg was to sit on a plinth. In reality, the proportions did not work out. It would be too tall. We made a clay egg, hoping it would be the same dimensions as the finished egg. Using paper towel rolls, clay snakes, tape, and cardboard, we made marquettes to figure out the best proportions. In the background is the plinth inspector. 
The interior of this form glowed like the sun. Dan was at the end of his semester and had finals, so I took over necking the egg in. Because the metal is hammered over his stake, there's a hole and it has to be filled. Ultimately, it would have to be capped to make it an egg form. Holly, who has been one of our goldsmiths for o over eight years, took the scrap left over from cutting out the disc. She heated it to over 1,700 degrees and poured the molten gold into a mold, creating a thick slab called an ingot, which she forged and rolled into a mill, in rolling in with a mill made it smooth. This would be heavier on the bottom, so it would help keep the egg staying upright. The goal was to form a cap of the exact proportions to make the egg contiguous and seamless. In order to get the proper shape, she made five brass models until one was right. It took a huge amount of mastery, ha master hammering, forming, and artistry to match the forms together. Holly is sanding the egg top so it will be perfectly smooth and will make a clean, smooth seam. Here is happy Holly holding up the <laughs> contiguous egg. It is not soldered yet. It is still two parts, yet it looks complete. Now it has to be soldered together, and this is the tricky part because the bottom is heavier and the top is thinner and heat rises. It would be very easy to melt the egg. We are four days from shipping and can have no errors. My husband, Bill, is contemplating how this will be done. He ingeniously created tabs to go on the inside of the egg, which would hold the top in place so it wouldn't move even a tenth of a millimeter, and he soldered it. Bill then took a jeweler saw, cut it in half, and here Holly and Bill are fitting rims to each half of the egg, and a third will be the um, sleeve. This project brought together the distinctive talents of four of our goldsmiths, each stepping in with their specialty. The egg on the um, next slide coming up is um, on the left, planished and rough and waiting to have the surface filed, sanded, and polished. The bottom has yet to be filed to form. The egg fits perfectly into the finely turned plinth by David Stenstrom. On the right, the egg has a final polish, and everyone who worked on it can be seen in the reflection, smiling because it was successfully completed on time. While the egg was, and its contents were in the final stage of completion, I worked on the shipping box, which was lined with suede cloth and upholstery foam. A major catastrophe was averted. I pulled the egg out of the foam line uh, outlined with marker for fitting, and it was covered in ink. Some Perel wipes removed the ink and saved the project. The finished egg is shown with the mementos that went inside a black silk pouch and into the egg. Mount Katahdin, and small eggs, a chicken, numbers for this numbers guy, airline peanuts, a ruler representing an investment rule he invented, a rat, a shield, and a chicken. This March, we received first place from the manufacturing jewelers of America for this custom design piece. We also won second place. <laughs> Never have I been so excited to look at an egg. That's beautiful, Patty. <laughs>